All right. Um, okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, let me know if there are any issues with sound. I will try to adjust my mic. Today's topic is testing. I will try to talk about various topics in testing. One thing I have to admit that I failed to do, which is BDD. I tried to write a test for BDD, but it would simply not be discovered for whatever reason. Uh, maybe someone can help me and we'll see about that. But roughly what I will do today is talk about testing frameworks, unit tests, UI tests, uh, about uh, integration testing, about uh, testability as a measure, and uh, about TDD and BDD. So let's get right to it. Why do we need tests is the first thing that we ask ourselves when we need to write one. You might argue that writing tests is something that costs a lot of time and that is not really worth it, but is it truly so? Sometimes we might think that code that we are writing tests for is not good. I mean, we write code for uh, we write tests for code and we struggle writing a simple test because everything is coupled, everything is tight, everything is doing more than one thing. But that's not a problem of a test itself. That's a problem of your code. So test it, tests uh, or testability in general is a measure for good code because it not only checks if our code works, it also increases our code quality. If you look on the picture on the right, you see all those nice things like controllability, observability, stability, simplicity, availability. That's testability metrics. And those are similar metrics to what a good code base should be. If we follow solid principles, we will achieve that. So software testability and the fact that code is testable is uh, by itself a metric which shows how good our code is. If we make something that fails and if it slips our eyes, it will cost a lot. The cost of fixing something when it's in production is incomparably much bigger than the cost of something that is still in development. Because if we are implementing something, we will need to test it anyways. And it's probably going to be broken when the first time we run it. It's, it's rarely ever that we write something perfectly without any bugs. We find bugs and we fix them. The problem is when those bugs slip us and appear in production. We should not tolerate it. We should not allow it. And uh, in order to prevent this from happening, unit tests, tests in general, are the way to go. Every single time before we deliver something, we need to check everything, not just the things that we fixed or added, but everything that our program, our software offers. So doing this every single time is a redundancy and tests, automated tests remove this redundancy. So in the long run, we save time and not waste time by writing tests. So before talking about unit tests, I would like to try to define what is a unit. And in my opinion, a unit is not a class and not a function. It's a feature. And a feature can be a bunch of functions and a bunch of classes if they're that tightly coupled. What my point is that if let's say you refactor something, uh, let's say a bigger class is being refactored and the the bigger the, the parts of it, well, they shouldn't be even tested because you are still testing the same thing, the same feature. So 
it's under test. It's covered. So testing that is redundant and not needed. Um, my other point is that unit tests, um, uh, sometimes we might need to test something that's private. And then we're looking at all sorts of attributes, how to expose a private method to a test. But we shouldn't think that way. If something is big enough and requires a test, then we should simply split it into its own component and have a public component with public, uh, with public functions. So a, a, a public class or, or an internal class doesn't really matter, but a class which is a part of another uh, bigger composition. So a composition which holds a private component, which exposes its public methods through the composition's public methods. And that's how we can test uh, private stuff through public uh, methods of a component, of a private component. So those are the two points to really understand when writing unit tests. Uh, in some cases, you might end up testing random things. And we don't want cases where our tests sometimes succeed and sometimes fail. We want it to always succeed. And in order for us to always succeed, we need to be in control. Being in control in terms of testing means mocking stuff. Mocking stuff, creating behavior which is meant only for the test. So it might mean having a result which is returned always the same or a function which does the same always and uh, it might simply do nothing. So my point being here is that we are in control of our class. So if we need random behavior, we need to mock random behavior. In .NET, random class has virtual methods. Next is a virtual method of a random class. So we don't even need to write a wrapper or something like that. We can simply mock random class as it, as it is and uh, make a mock for the next uh, method, set up the next method, uh, enforcing that it returns zero or one or 50, depending on what we need. So like this, now we have a, a random behavior, which always returns zero. So it's not so random. If we have a case where we need to test something that's really heavy, that takes up lots of performance, we should mock it as well. Uh, other than mocking it, we should also uh, initialize it, do this test setup. Uh, do the test setup for the whole test suit for the related things, because we don't want to reinitialize, let's say a connection for an integration test when, when we call it like hundreds of times, well, maybe not hundreds, but like dozens of times in a test suit, we should do it once open a connection and close it at the end, uh, because it takes time or writing something heavy, well, that should be ignored. Uh, or use uh, our dummy uh, database, Sandbox. So how does that look like in practice? Well, if we have a file reader, for example, reading a big file takes up quite a lot. Um, so here we have file reader Text, test fixture, which basically says that we set up our file reader. We mock it. And our file reader, by reading any file, returns hello world. And we use it like this. This is XUnit, by the way. Uh, you can tell that from fact attribute. Anyways, uh, we have our class fixture file reader test fixture, which basically sets file reader in our test and file reader uh, 
basically we have four files and we need to test if statistics processing works of another class. So we are not testing if file reading is correct. We're testing if, um, if statistics processing is correct. So here we pass in files for a statistics processor, but uh, actually file reader should have been a, a part of statistics processor and process should be uh, something like, or, or add file should be something that should go to stats processor. So it's my bad here. But anyways, we have stats processor, which reads files using the file reader component. And then we get all sorts of statistics like common word from the stats processor. And here in the end, we test if the common word is as expected. We are in control. It's fast because we mocked it. It's not reading an actual file. It's rather returning something hard coded. So like this, we have tested some behavior of something that's IO. I should also probably, God damn it, change the title of uh, the lesson because it's still old one. Sorry about that. Anyways, let's continue. There are two types of testing, white box and black box testing. Black box test, white box testing is when we're testing input, output, and what happens in between. Meaning that we test also the function calls itself, uh, the different asserts, uh, different, uh, uh, if certain points in our application were hit basically. It's as important as the other things, as input and output. Uh, and an example of white box testing would be, let's say, when you're sending a bank transaction, uh, uh, when you're uh, doing a bank uh, bank transaction, basically, and when you're sending funds from one account to another. So it is not enough to just check if. Uh, you subtracted like if you lost that much money that you sent and if the other person got the other account got that much money that you sent it's also needed to check uh, all the sensitive things like validation what was it validated was it uh, processed by the bank by your bank by the other person's bank why do we need this well because it's sensitive and if it just gives us the right result, but misses the steps that we need, it gives a serious vulnerability to the system. So we don't want to let that happen. We want to prevent that and cut the possibilities of that happening. And we can only do that. I mean, we, we can risk it and make it less secure by just skipping this assert, or we can double check it every time we do our tests. So it's used in cases like that. The bad thing about white box testing is that it demands mocking. It demands that everything is mocked except the one thing under the test. And another thing is that it requires testing the implementation details. And we don't want to be always testing implementation details because if implementation changes, the code for testing will change as well. That is a bad thing. And that is probably the most uh, unattractive thing for, for testing. You don't want to uh, do things twice for both testing and code uh, and, and just implementation of, of features. You don't want to write both at the same time and rewrite one when the other changes. That's just not how testing uh, works. I mean, that's not sexy and attractive for, for coding. So second, so white box example, user sends money. Well, I just said something similar. Black box testing is when we have input and output, everything that's in between, it doesn't matter. So we are setting up our test with an input. And we are asserting if the output is as expected. Everything in between doesn't matter. And this that's the kind of testing we should go for in most cases, because that's 
what we know in most cases. We know what we need and we know what we have, but we not always know how that's going to be achieved other than just calling a function. Black box thinking like this helps and that's a go-to. So for example, sometimes we have cases where a uh, result is not directly returned, but it can be still retrieved. For example, creating an account usually returns a void, but selecting the account by some properties that it used for creation should return the account. So if the operation of creating an account succeeded, we should be able to retrieve it. Simple. And that's unit test. <clears throat> um, another thing about integration testing, oh, integration testing. So integration testing from unit testing, the difference is that uh, basically mocking is not needed and you're no longer testing a component in the isolation. You're rather testing how it works with other things. So you're testing the full thing, everything in your program, how it communicates. So it's still a black box, but, uh, there is no mocking involved at all. Mocking might be involved if you want to remove the slow steps. Tests should be fast. And by mocking, we can ensure that. So integration testing helps. Uh, well, not, not for that reason, but mocking helps in integration testing too, in terms of making tests run fast. And what testing frameworks are there? In .NET, natively, we have a mess test. That's the default uh, framework used by .NET, a uh, single platform. It does not support it on other platforms. It's just on .NET. It's quite old and uh, signature attributes for MS tests is test class and test method. Test class basically marking a class which can run tests and test method is basically the test itself. And this is how a test looks like in MS tests. We have a test class, a count test and test method. And here we send, uh, we basically say that a source has a certain deposit and a destination, we're sending a deposit to destination account. And in the end, we are asserting if it is as it is. <clears throat> I am appending uh, with OK because uh, we are supposed to test cases where it fails or succeeds. In this case, I'm testing if it succeeded. So OK is for tests with which tests success. Uh, by the way, in C Sharp, we are usually using a uh, Pascal case meaning for method names, meaning that every method starts with a capital letter and every word in a method goes with capital letter as well. But that is not the case for uh, unit tests. Unit and why is it not the case for unit tests? Because reading long words like long sentences in, in something that's Pascal cased is really a mess. So for that reason, for testing, we are using, um, <coughs> underscore in other words, snake case for writing multiple words in a single test. <clears throat> and that makes it a bit more readable. XUnit is another framework. XUnit is multi-platform. It's fairly fresh. It focuses on a principle that tests should be clean, just like your code. And why is this so important? What does it do differently, essentially? Well, 
it no longer uses methods, special methods or special attributes for doing test setup, test fixture, or <clears throat> or 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 tear down, cleanups. It it does it by itself naturally. Its goal is to make the flow of test as natural as possible. So test setup is nothing else than just a constructor. Test cleanup is nothing else than uh, a dispose method. And a test uh, <coughs> setup for all tests is nothing else than inheriting a base class and accepting a class fixture <coughs> and setting stuff from it to your shared stuff. <coughs> so it's really cool and I think in terms of clean tests, Exclunet wins hands down against the other two. Uh, Exunit is also descriptive. It uses stuff which is not needed just for a test. It gives extra information about the method because Exunit uses facts and theories. Facts for <clears throat> tests which take no input and theories for tests which uses parameters. So facts and theories. And this is, uh, uh, I forgot to fix this one. <clears throat> Instead here, if this was a, an X unit test, text fixture, test fixture would not be needed. And instead of test, it, it would be <clears throat> uh, fact. And instead of R equal, it would be equal. And that's how X unit would be. <clears throat> I made a mistake here. <clears throat> N unit is the oldest multi-platform testing framework. And it has test fixture and test <clears throat> for attributes for running tests. And this is how N units test looks like. There is a way how we can handle asserts in a different way, in a more human readable way. And in .NET, we have fluent assert library, which provides us asserts in, in this manner with should, <clears throat> should keyword. And with should keyword, we can assert if an exception is thrown just like that. Or if a function does something. So here we see an example. <clears throat> we transfer funds when it exceeds our, <clears throat> our uh, capital. So <clears throat> if we transfer more than we have, it throws an exception. <clears throat> with uh, <clears throat> fluent assert, we can check that it's exactly the exception that we want. Fluent assert is also more descriptive because if it fails, it will show why it failed, what happened, a bit more information usually than other frameworks. In other frameworks, if you have a collection and it fails, it just shows that the assert of collections did not match. <clears throat> but in, uh, in Fluent Assert, it, it probably will also show the elements inside the collection. Now let's move on to the next topic, TDD and BDD. TDD, or in other words, test-driven development. It's a mindset where <clears throat> we first write a test and then write code for the test. The good thing about TDD is that it enforces us to have 100% test coverage. TDD is great because it, <clears throat> it is a mindset of a developer who knows what needs to be done without knowing how. And this is how we most usually go around things. And that's how it should be, I think. 
it's not bad not to know how to do it when you need to do it. It's a process. And starting with understanding what needs to be done and what needs to be checked is a good start. Uh, maybe free runner, maybe appending okay to all methods is not, is not needed, but, <clears throat> but that's the convention. <clears throat> And here you can see um, how writing t test, how test driven development process should be like. <clears throat> of course, we start with writing a test. We then implement a feature and we run a test. <clears throat> if a test is still broken, if it fails, we write a new test in case it, uh, it covers an edge case, for example. <clears throat> Maybe we added zero plus zero and the result was an exception. So we write a, a test for that. Not just checking if A plus B is, is actually A plus B. And the way we implement our tests initially is by just doing it. Doesn't matter how. We can go to Stack Overflow and copy paste raw code, or we can go <clears throat> literally copy paste our old code. Doesn't matter. Test needs to work and it needs to be done ASAP. That's the first step of implementing a feature. Now, when you have a working test with a working feature, you should refactor it. Refactor the test. Uh, not the test, but the code, the feature, so that it's clean, so that it's pretty. And finally, run the test again. <clears throat> Fix the broken stuff, and if it's broken, and then in the end, you can finally commit. Commit and be happy with what you did, because you just made a feature with full tests. It's called red green refactoring because uh, we first write it without a fear that it fails. We actually are happy that if we cover the case which failed, then we fix the code, split our test to the case which made it fail <clears throat> and write uh, and, and uh, try to fix uh, our code so that it covers the case which failed. Now we run the tests again and if it is succeeded, we can refactor. That's red-green refactoring, test-driven development. BDD is a part of test-driven development. It's a mutation of TDD. Basically, for a, a way for a customer to be involved in a uh, a development process. BDD gives us a way of writing tests in a super readable way. Anyone can write it. <clears throat> so basically BDD is made of two things, of features and scenarios. A feature is like a description for what, what the part, what the unit under test does. And scenario is um, a bunch of steps which need to be executed for the feature to be tested. So <clears throat> given is initial setup and is a part of that initial setup. Uh, when is an action that you execute and then is an assert. So BDD in the end is like a living do documentation <coughs> of capabilities for your code, for your software. Living because it comes naturally. Another example of feature is like this. <coughs> uh, 
uh, again, all those things are just descriptions. <clears throat> so given there is a question, what's your favorite color with answers red one, cucumber green one, <clears throat> when upvote answer cucumber green, then the answer cucumber green should not be on top. Should should be on top, sorry. <clears throat> so a very simple feature, human readable, no coding needed. And the the implementation for the previous one would be like this. Uh, you basically have a calculator. You implement each step. <clears throat> And in the end, you assert, hello, Moby, Mon. <clears throat> and running it should look like basically each step. Now, the final part of this lesson is UI tests. <clears throat> basically, we have <clears throat> UI testing for web and desktop. Desktop actually also suits the same things for desktop suit uh, for uh, mobile applications in most cases, Appium, for example. Anyways, web, most common UI testing for web is Selenium. It allows us to automate tests uh, uh, to, uh, to script something ourselves, to do the automation of selecting, clicking, executing JavaScript and all sorts of fancy things. <clears throat> it uses a web driver, iWeb driver for controlling all sorts of things. And all major browsers support it, including Chrome, uh, Firefox, uh, Internet Explorer, Selenium also <coughs> has uh, <coughs> capabilities of recording tests, but it has uh, competitors like Catalan Recorder, which basically <coughs> does similar things, but in a more intuitive way. So we will try to see how that works in practice. For desktop, we have Appium, UI testing is cool, yeah. For testing, we have Appium, which is like Selenium, but for desktop applications. And Inspect EXE is a tool which comes with Windows SDK, which lets us basically pick stuff, uh, <clears throat> pick stuff, inspect stuff uh, that, that uh, our applications have, any application has actually. I will try to demonstrate all of it after the lesson, in a demo session, at the end of the lesson, sorry, not after it. <clears throat> so Selenium. With Selenium, we can script everything or record macros. <clears throat> I'll mention that. And it works like this. We basically create a specific driver, which opens a browser. Driver is like a browser with automation. <clears throat> uh, by setting a URL, we navigate to some website and it supports all sorts of selectors through which we can select some HTML element. Uh, we can get selector <clears throat> by simply hitting F12, getting DevTools on the browser, right clicking on an HTML element and saying copy XPath or copy CSS selector. <coughs> Everything works in Selenium. So after getting the element, we can work with it. We can interact with it. We can manipulate it however we want. So here I just selected a test box. <coughs> uh, then I selected a button and I said, click the button. 
not a real test, just a demonstration how you work with Selenium. <clears throat> if you're interested on how to fully test application with Selenium or with uh, Appium, here is a link in the right <clears throat> bottom corner where you can do all the testing, where it's uh, well defined in a tutorial. <clears throat> Testing desktop with Appium <clears throat> is as simple as testing web with Selenium. <clears throat> uh, the only difference is that it uses a Windows driver, only, always, and the rest is the same. If you're testing application, there's probably Android driver, iOS driver, something like that. Again, you can select elements by their IDs and stuff like that. <clears throat> <clears throat> so it's very similar. Um, here is how Appium is in practice. Uh, it's a tiny bit different. We basically need a port, uh, basically a, a URL for <clears throat> where our uh, Appium web driver is listening so that it can record and capture our interactions. <clears throat> and, and then we need to define a path of our application <clears throat> that we need to open and manipulate. When we have those two, we can create a driver, which of course opens the application. And here is a test case. Uh, we basically add two numbers together we basically press one, then plus, then two, then equals. And the result should be that in the test box of result, we should see three displayed. And that's it. Uh, so to sum this up, what, what tests and how many do we need? The answer is very simple. <clears throat> as many, as long as the test, the, the code is tested. So the amount matters not so much. Small application can have single, uh, simple integration tests <clears throat> because unit tests <clears throat> tell us where it failed and not only if it succeeded. Integration tests only tell us the fact if it succeeded or not, not where it failed, exactly where. <clears throat> so that's why uh, for different purposes, we should focus on different kinds of tests, but what matters the most that our applications should be tested. And now let me show you <clears throat> a demo of three things. First, let's run a demo of uh, of uh, this calculator. <clears throat> Let me demonstrate you a calculator application. <clears throat> really simple. I made it in like uh, one hour, half an hour. <clears throat> so you have numbers. Uh, when you press a number, it appears here in the text box. When you press plus, it, it writes a plus symbol. And when you plus again, uh, when, when you press numbers again, well, <clears throat> it just puts stuff in the text box. When you hit enter, it evaluates it. If you hit C, it clears the thing. If you write something like this, you cannot stack it together. Like if I press equals, it just removes it. So that's our calculator, pretty simple. <coughs> now a test for it looks like this. We first have a test fixture. We need this because we don't want four applications running at the same time <coughs> for four different cases. And we don't want uh, to keep uh, 
to basically clean it once and open it once, not for every test. That's why we need a fixture, test fixture. <clears throat> now for calculator itself, uh, basically those are the implementations of each step. But the implementation, uh, what is a uh, feature? <clears throat> I will show you soon. Uh, if feature is basically, uh, I, I will show you, remind me, uh, it will be the fourth thing that I'll show you. So bear with me. <clears throat> uh, so here we have tests and each method basically calls this. We take two numbers, operation, and we have our expected result. Okay, so we find those numbers in our test. We do something with them. Again, we find those numbers. Find by element name means uh, that it looks for the UI elements by what they displays, what they renders. So I'm looking for uh, an element one. Uh, let me open the <clears throat> application. It will be easier to follow, I think. So here it means that I am looking for element one, then I'm clicking it. Then it says, uh, for, for a number, any number. Then it says that I am clicking some operation. Let's say plus. And then it says that I'm hitting some other number and then in the end I am clicking this and it says that the result should be as inputted. So I'm asserting that this in the end is what I expect it to be. That's my test and each operation is tested. <clears throat> uh, note here though a dispose and this dispose is called after each test. So when this, so the flow would be this. Before all tests start, this is executed. I basically open my application once, then I do a test method and then I clean it. Then I do another test method and then I clean it again. Uh, I need to clean it up because I don't want uh, it to be stacking. I don't want it to be one plus two <clears throat> equals three plus one plus two equals four. I mean, it, it, it won't work that way. So I need to clean it. I need to make my test stateless so that <clears throat> the previous result of a test does not influence the next result of a test. So let's run our test, shall we? Uh, to run tests, usually you go to uh, test, windows, test explorer. And I shall go to desktop. And we have those four tests. <clears throat> so if I right click, run selected tests, it shall do the flow as it should. Uh, I'm not sure why it didn't run. <coughs> uh, it's doing something, not sure what. I'm not sure why it's not running them. Um, <clears throat> not sure. Maybe I need to run from that place. Okay. So here you see it in action. Uh, it you you might think that it's working slow. <clears throat> uh, Actually, okay, that's the speed of it. 
<laughs> it, it could work faster. <clears throat> I think I could set up the speed. But... Uh, hmm, okay. So this uh, test explorer doesn't seem to work and this one does. <clears throat> I don't know why. This explorer is of resharper. Maybe they're both messing up. I don't know. So here you can see how each test uh, works. And what I would also like to show is this window. This window is the driver itself, Windows driver. And you can see how <clears throat> it reacts with all the commands, all the selects, all the find element by name and click it uh, that I required it to do. And here you can see the test results. Four tests passed. Now let's do some web testing with Selenium and not Appium. This was Appium. I don't need this. Okay. So if I go to this application, let's <coughs> open it. So this is a simple website, basically a, a template website, just like you would uh, get by creating <clears throat> a new project. Uh, Endervance asked it will work on controls that is in other tab or I will have to select it first. <clears throat> I think uh, you asked whether or not the test runs in background, I think, and it does. So let the window pop. Oh wait, it doesn't. Okay, this one does not. Like if I move my mouse, it, it messes it up completely. So you need to wait it run. Maybe it is configurable to run, but I'm not sure. Maybe. I know for a fact that web tests work uh, in a way that you don't have to <clears throat> physically have the uh, application open, but for, for desktop testing, you need it. For whatever reason, I don't know. <clears throat> Back to this application. Template application, the only difference is that we have this button. Basically, whatever we input here, testing button will output in an alert box. Very simple, and we want to test this. <clears throat> so what do we do? Uh, we have our very similar thing. Again, fixture, which uh, opens home URL, <clears throat> and which navigates to the contact page. And then <coughs> we create a Chrome driver because I'm using Chrome as a browser. Uh, so the driver itself is in this directory, in the bin directory. So that's where I get my Chrome driver from. And uh, I, I open basically the uh, browser with Chrome driver. And in the end, this post will close. In my dummy app test, uh, I define a port where home URL is. And I go to the page. Maybe those are not needed, I'm not sure. Doesn't matter. <clears throat> so I'm testing a bunch of stuff. First, I'm testing if marketing contact is okay. Basically, <clears throat> if this value is what it should be, so you see the cert, uh, cert equal if this is the same as the selected element, then that's fine. I'm just double checking if rendering works. Then I'm checking if I n inputted nothing that this is opened with nothing as well. And lastly, I'm checking that if I input it something that it's opened, it opens with <coughs> something as well. Specifically, that if I enter Almontas, it prints Almontas. And here's a method which basically <coughs> makes it a bit slower. 
to make it visible, <coughs> I slow it down by wait time MS. So here, if I set it to one, we basically will see nothing and it will be almost instant. <coughs> so let's run it. My test starts with opening the browser, navigating the page, inputting stuff, <laughs> and it's done super fast. So let's put uh, a timer, <coughs> sorry, a timeout. So that's not so fast. Now it, uh, after each input that I pressed in the in, uh, input box, it will delay <coughs> for half a second. So here it's inputting stuff slowly runs it, asserts it, and it's done. Uh, a question was, does it work if I have it in different tab? And the answer is yes. I switched the window <clears throat> and you can see my browser closed immediately and it still works. All tests passed. Let's make this test passed as well. <clears throat> Just rerun it, not messing it, not interfering with it. Uh, usually, uh, really dedicated <coughs> and serious QA teams, quality assurance teams uses tools like this because why would they want to click stuff all over and over again? Why would they want to do the monkey job? We don't want to be monkeys. We want to be <coughs> people who know what they have and use the tools that they can use at hand. If we can automate stuff, then why not? So. One more thing that I want to show is <clears throat> how it works in, um, in, in practice for a BDD. Basically, you need to <clears throat> first install an extension in Visual Studio uh, for Specflow. So here you see Specflow. You need to install this. Then you need to get a bunch of nuggets, uh, spec flow. Why do I have only this, I wonder? <coughs> Basically spec flow run uh, and spec flow is the nuggets that you need. And then it will let you build features. So if I go here and, and say, <coughs> spec, uh, I create a new feature. Uh, so I think the Appenium uh, depends on the mouse cursor to access the control. Is it right? <clears throat> yes, it is. That's correct. And BDD based development, uh, behavior driven development basically says that we have features. So we have feature files, which anyone can write, a client can write this, but then we right click on this file and we can say generate step definitions. We select which of those steps that, uh, that we want. And here is the scenario, the things that are actually what matters. Uh, we can preview of course, and it shows, uh, how it looks like. <clears throat> and then we hit generate and then we say save and we have our test basically that we need to implement. So instead of those things, <coughs> we need to, um, we need to implement those steps in what they do. So if I have a calculator, which adds one number, then, uh, then we press uh, this. <clears throat> we need to basically set those two numbers, simulate that add is passed and, and take the result. And then here we need to assert the result. And that's how our feature would be tested in BDD. Here we, we would need to create the calculator itself and uh, manipulate it. Unfortunately, I have something similar and it didn't work for me. Uh, basically, if you look at BDD. It's a bit weird as this doesn't get recognized. On second thought, 
I should somehow have a, a different uh, test explorer for it. So it's it's a bit weird, as you see. It's it's I don't know. It's weird. <laughs> I don't know how to define it. And it also first does a uh, spec run evaluation. Then I don't know. Maybe the output error list shows the warnings. Scenario context is as valid. Ta -ta -ta. <coughs> Maybe that's why I, I don't really know. I don't do this at work. In fact, I don't do TD. I, I try to do TDD at work, but my colleagues don't really do it. So <clears throat> it's not as, uh, as uh, familiar as it should be. Though, though I do like writing tests in general. I like using X unit and writing tests using Fluent Assert too. The last thing that I wanted to show is how we can test the same with <coughs> other tools. There is an extension for browser called Catalan Recorder. There's also an application, a desktop application called Catalan Studio. It also works for uh, desktop applications and uh, main, sorry, not desktop applications, but for um, um, Android applications and iOS applications for the mobile, I mean. So with this, we can do the same things. <coughs> so let me do the same thing that I did with code in Selenium. I press record and you will see how you can make your own uh, test in five seconds. So boom, I clicked and then I typed my name. Boom. I say, okay. And that's it. I say stop and my test is done. <laughs> if I hit run, it does the same and it basically ran the same steps. Uh, we can run this uh, step by step. So it first uh, goes to this page, <coughs> goes to this page, then it goes to the contact page, selects <coughs> the uh, contact, uh, the, the test link, it then types my name and then it clicks the testing button. Uh, but I don't know why it didn't open the the alert message. Maybe it closes it immediately. I'm not sure. Hmm. <coughs> I think it should. <coughs> well, other tests we can do like, uh, sure, it, it opens. It opens the window. We can assert that the title is what we expect it to be. Here, for example, we can still say, hey, I want this title to be this. I want those things to be like this. And we can check it. So let's play it, stop it and play it. And again, we can see here we pro it, it failed for some reason, but I think it fails when we, <clears throat> you know, this is, I think three elements. And I basically tried to assert three elements as one. Well, I was wrong. Kind of. <clears throat> 
basically it's three elements. So the value of this is not what I expected and it failed. Well, that is expected. So that's a bad assert. Anyways, with tools like this, we can, again, really simplify <coughs> our development process. <coughs> Sorry for coughing like that. <laughs> I really need some drink. Um, and one more thing that I wanted to show. So you can add your own commands. Basically, <coughs> Uh, click the button. Uh, let's say I say K and then a run. I made a mistake. Okay. Pom pom pom, and it fails. <clears throat> oh, uh, stop and play. Why didn't it fail at clicking the button? Oh, oh, it, it, it's not that it failed, but it's still executing. It's, you see, wait until element is found. So it's, it's, it's uh, waiting until timeout has passed and it failed. But the, the great, the interesting part about this tool is that look what it shows. It shows us a snapshot of the window of where it failed. So not only does the testing and not only it automates stuff, but it also gives us a snapshot of a state of a web page uh, where it failed. I think this tool can do everything. And if you know how to use it, it will do magic. Lastly, look at this. If I know how to work with it, I can do as much as exporting this into a C sharp test case, test suit file. So look, we have uh, tests in MS test or tests in <laughs> any unit with web driver, basically Selenium under the hood. I wonder why it uses Firefox, but that doesn't really matter iWeb driver and that's Selenium stuff. If you see this, <coughs> it's all Selenium under the hood. So here, typical Selenium test case generated by you with this nice tool. Nifty, cool. <coughs> and to wrap this up, I would like to say that we are developers and not monkeys. We are not clickers. We are supposed to code our stuff, to make our tooling, to use what tooling we have. So don't do the clicking yourself or at least do it once and then reuse it. Just like all other things we do in software. Automated testing is not a magic unicorn. It exists, it's usable, it's awesome. And in most cases, it gives immediate value to your application development process. So use it because it helps, not because someone else uses it, not because uh, people talk about it, but because it helps you at this very moment. So that's all for this lesson. <clears throat> Thank you for, <coughs> for uh, your attention. Uh.